there's obviously something very wrong with that mountain. I don't care who you talk to. If you talk to anyone who's been up there, they'll tell you it's kind of weird and eerie. Glastonbury Mountain was kind of a place that you didn't want to go. And some people have said, do not go to Glastonbury Mountain if you are wearing anything red. It was a term that was coined by um, Vermont author and folklorist Joe Citrow. I think he um, first used the term Bennington Triangle in a, in a um, radio interview back in 1992. So the Bennington Triangle, uh, I believe it was Joseph Citrow that came up with that term and began using it, which is wonderful. I hasten to add here that triangle is not a geometric term. People keep asking me, well, what are the three coordinates of the triangle? It, there are no coordinates. It's just, it's a metaphysical term that's used to de designate a mysterious area. In this case, the mystery just kept getting deeper. There have been a number of disappearances in the area with people. The core of the Bennington Triangle are a series of missing persons cases from right here in Bennington County. They kind of center around Glastonbury Mountain, um, which is between kind of Bennington and Manchester, just a little bit to the east in the, in the um, Green Mountains. Some odd things people see, like strange lights, uh, UFOs. The, uh, people have claimed Bigfoot sightings as well. Wild men running through the woods and whatnot. There's a lot of different theories from falling into abandoned wells to, you know, UFO abductions. There are kind of five canonical missing person stories that are associated with the Bennington Triangle. Probably most famous is the um, case of Paula Jean Weldon, who was an 18-year-old Bennington College student. I think it was December 1st, 1946. She had gone out for a walk. During exam week, uh, she, worked, she worked at the, the cafeteria on campus at Bennington College. And she told her roommate that she wanted to go on a hike, on a walk. And everybody was busy with exams. And she went off by herself and was seen hitchhiking down Route 9. Uh, a gentleman gave her a ride, uh, dropped her off at his house. And he told her that she would need to continue on to the long trail. He gave her directions. There is said to have been um, uh, a couple that spotted her walking towards the trailhead late in the afternoon around four o'clock. And of course, in early December, the sun sets at 4.30. She was wearing a red coat, a pair of sneakers. She didn't seem to be very well prepared to be going on a hike on the long trail um, around the time that the sun was setting. She was seen by a whole bunch of people because it was a beautiful, beautiful day out. The last sighting of her was an older couple was behind her and she turned and when they turned, Paula was no longer there. She was never seen again after that, that afternoon around four o'clock. There was no evidence ever found. They, there was a huge search for, for days. They closed the campus, all the students, the faculty were out looking for her. It was one, one of the, I think at, at that point, the largest search in history. I mean, a lot of people made reports of possible sightings of her in other parts of New England, but they never found any definitive evidence of what happened to her after that point. Her father was well connected in Connecticut. The Connecticut State Police got involved. There were a lot of local agencies. The Vermont State Police, which was formed the next year as a result of um, her missing person case, has a 600 plus page um, case file connected to the case. So the first to disappear was Mitty Rivers. Now Mitty was in his early 70s. He was quite the hunter. He knew those trails and those forests. He was with his brother-in-law and a number of other men, and they were hunting. Mitty was up ahead, leading the crew, and he had happened to turn off, and Mitty was never seen again. The only thing they found after an extensive search was one of the cartridges from his gun in the river. He was 75 years old. It's very possible that he was unwell, but as I recall, he had had a recent physical and he was fine to go into the woods. Um, getting out of the woods apparently was another issue for him. There's also the story of James Telford. Which is particularly mysterious if we can believe it. James was a veteran in World War II. He lived in Bennington at the old soldier's home and he was uh, 
coming back from St. Albans, visiting relatives up there. And he was, I guess, just going down Route 7. Now, James was on the bus and they were on their way uh, to Bennington. On that day, however, there happened to be one heck of a snowstorm and it really slowed the ride down. Everyone, the bus driver and many other people saw James on the bus all the way there. His luggage was there and he had some papers with him, a magazine. And when they reached Bennington, he had vanished. No one saw him get off, no one saw him get on even the bus driver, and he would have passed the bus driver getting getting off, he, he seemed to vanish from on the bus. As long, unlikely as that sounds, it does give the, the whole series of vanishings a certain eerie, very mysterious air. Paula Weldon and James Telford both disappeared on the same day, exactly three years apart. In 1950, that's the next next year, um, it was this little kid, eight-year-old boy named Paul Jepson. He was with his mother. She went to take care of the pigs. Paul was in the pickup truck and he was wearing a, a red jacket. When his mother came back, he had completely disappeared. Now, an extensive search was done they used some bloodhounds, and the bloodhounds followed his scent all the way to a highway extremely close to where Paula Weldon disappeared as well. The next disappearance, also in 1950, was Frida Langer. She was another seasoned woods person with a camp on Glastonbury Mountain. She was camping with her family. She was out hunting or fishing with her cousin. She slipped into some water, ran back to the, to the camp to change her clothes, and never reappeared. However, they did actually find her remains about three miles uh, down the river. It was found the next year after the snow melted in an area where the searchers would have looked. Um, right by the reservoir. They, they would have looked there. There's no question. They probably went over it two or three times. The search was extensive. If she had been there, they would have found her. And that's why this is mysterious, because someone, apparently someone or something, took her and then put her back. We, we, I, I, don't, I don't know what to make of it. I don't know whether they're all related. They're related because of geography and because of time. They all vanished in the last three three months of the year, over over a five year period. Their ages were all over the place. From I think Paul Jepson was like eight years old, and Mitty Rivers was seventy five. So it wasn't an age thing, nor was it a man or woman thing. There were probably an equal number of men as women. Most of them were never found, and I don't think any reasonable unifying theory has ever come up. I hiked to Glassenberry, toward Glassenberry at one point. When you get to a point where you don't hear anything, you get to the point where there are no birds, no sounds, it's dead silence. Now, you walk up the trail and obviously crunch, crunch under your boots. You can hear gravel and whatnot. But if you listen closely, you'll hear footsteps in the back of you. You stop, those footsteps stop. You keep going, you begin to hear them again. You know, I have been up there. I've poked around up there. I didn't find any reason for the vanishings, nor did I vanish. And, then, and, and it was pretty easy to find um, you know, abandoned cellar holes and to presume that nearby there might be wells, long abandoned wells into which people could have tumbled. You can't live here for too long and not know about the Bennington Triangle, aliens and Bigfoot. But I do know that over the last few years and quite recently, um, there have been a lot of Bigfoot sightings down in that neck of the woods. 
I've interviewed some of the people who saw these critters, and uh, those are like face-to-face -face interviews. I've got a pretty good detector, built-in lie detector, after talking to people for, you know, 30 years researching this stuff. And this guy was absolutely, absolutely on the level. He saw a big, hairy critter walking along beside Route 7 in an area where it would be dangerous to do so as a joke because you know people in vermont drive around and pick up trucks with, with 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 rifles in the back window and you know if you see a big hairy bear-like critter somebody's going to take a shot at it and then of course you have the abernaki tribe which used to reside around that area now the abernakis believe that glassonbury mountain is where the four winds met and they believed the area to be cursed. The only time the Abernathy went to Glastonbury was to bury dead enemies. When I looked at them, you see Mitty Rivers, the hunter, it looked like he got lost in the woods or was, was and one of the speculations was that he may have been accidentally shot by another hunter and his body was hidden. And those, um, those are likely possibilities. I mean, he was an experienced hunter, but he should not have gone off by himself and the rest of his party. Or he could have had a heart attack and died somewhere and they just never found him. James Tet Tetford, I think his name was, who was a, had some, some mental illness or perhaps dementia. He got on a bus and was going to know where he got off. He disappeared somewhere and was never seen. And there was Paul Jepson, the young boy who was at the dump with his, in Shaftesbury, I believe, with his mother. Uh, he wandered off while she was feeding the hogs. You know, he, and he had, he had a, a nervous ailment was the way it was described in the newspapers. They didn't get very clear on it, but he had something that I don't think he was in school and he wandered off in the woods and got, must have gotten lost and wandered farther than anybody looked. And I didn't see, I don't, didn't see any connections between those or any, any uh, Bennington monsters or those kinds of things involved in that. I think the most interesting one was the Frida Langer case. Uh, she went off, supposedly fell into a brook, and the only witness to this was her cousin. He supposedly escorted her up to 150 feet away from the cabin. God knows why he wouldn't have walked her the rest of the way. She was soaking wet. And he said he brought her back and then she, she never got to the cabin and disappeared. What was weird about it is that her cousin, he was, he was quite suspicious, behaved suspiciously because there was an inquest in Brattleboro and he was supposed to be interviewed that day. And instead he went out looking for her with a group of people from Benmont Paper Manufacturing Company. And there was also a police presence looking for her elsewhere in the area. And he'd separated from them. And then he shows up two o'clock in the afternoon and he was supposed to be in Brattleboro at one or something. And he uh, said he was just, he thought he could make it back in time. It's just kind of weird. So I started researching Paula Weldon's case and I honestly, I couldn't find any relationship between her and these other cases. They seemed so, so totally different circumstances. So I knew about a, the Connie Smith case in, in Connecticut and she had disappeared in 1952. The circumstances there seemed similar, where she was hitchhiking near the New York border and disappeared and was never found. I found uh, a few cases that, that seemed related, and then there was one that jumped off the page, and that's when Catherine Hull shows up. And Catherine Hull disappeared in 1936 uh, in, New in Lebanon Springs, New York, and she was last seen hitchhiking, and she disappeared. And seven years later, hunters found her skeleton under a tree outside of Pittsfield, Mass. I thought now, there could be really a relationship between the three disappearances. And now I, I don't have proof of that. I don't claim to have proof of that, but it's a, a reasonable hypothesis. And then my hypothesis is that uh, there might have been someone who knew the roads and would look for opportunities. So this is not a serial killer who is on, constantly on the prowl but maybe a serial killer who looks for an opportunity where someone's hitchhiking by herself, no, no witnesses around, offers a ride, and then takes them back into New York State. And we don't know what happened to them, of course.
after I published this story and talked about it on some TV shows and radio shows, people sought me out to find out more about it. And among those who sought me out, there were two um, cold case investigators, so-called. They were both ex-military detectives and they had retired. And I guess they were just looking for mysteries to solve. Now they, they contacted me at different times. One of them committed suicide and I'm not suggesting there was any causal relationship, but it was weird. And the other one said that he had found Paula Weldon's body and he knew where it was. All he would say was that she was buried in the trunk of a car somewhere next to the long trail. And he was going to, he was going to arrange this big press event and finally put an end to this vanishing of Paula Weldon mystery. And then I waited to hear from him and didn't, and it went on and on. I didn't hear from him. So I, I tried calling him, phone number didn't work. Tried the email I had used with him, that didn't work anymore. I did kind of a search for him and apparently, I'm not willing to say that he vanished, but he dropped the whole issue. Possibly like the vanishings themselves, they might just be a coincidence. But I still have never heard from this guy again. These are just some of the stories surrounding Glastonbury Mountain. It's hard to deny the eerie coincidences that surround these mysteries. This has been Lore of the Shires. Stay tuned for our next episode, where we uncover the fear of the undead.